How the Lift started by mistake a little bit with a video that we had put together a, a, as a fun run. It blows my mind that we have millions of views, 18 million views on YouTube. We started How to Lift because he was getting a little bored. I just want to feel like this. And then the Bahamas trip from Miami to the Bahamas in a speedboat went super viral. And Sarah and I were, were left looking at it going, do we just drop it? Maine's a state that prides itself on being tough, you know? It's cold, it's, it's got extremes. And, and I think that's kind of, I think that's bred into you being a Mainer. It's a rugged state and you want a rugged business. And when you're, when you're here and you have your business here, it, I think it makes you appreciate the state more, you know? So 100%. When you grew up from a, from a tough, not a tough background, but a, a modest background, life was hard. So I think, it, I think it's that, that modest background that gives you not only the hunger, but also the necessity to innovate. And so from a very young age, my brother and I were at the back of the classroom. We were those kids, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old that were blowing things up in the chemistry lab. But back then, as long as we were learning from it, we had really encouraging players in our lives, like my mom. My mom, that was her mantra. She was like, look, you guys are kind of hellions, but as long as you're learning from it and you're, you're not hurting anybody, go, do it, experiment, figure out this world. And, you know, maybe you can make it a better place. So with adults, I think like mentors, teachers, that type of thing, we were always very encouraged. So I think a lot of people did see something in us. It was like, you know, they're putting their mind to something great. Like, let's not, you know, discipline them. I think back in the day, Mike and I, I think somewhat got encouraged by our creativity, so to speak. I was super advanced, super dorky, but I had no money. And I came from a really poor family, so I wanted to go to a really good school. And Bowdoin College is a really good school, but it's also one of the most expensive schools on earth. So I decided that, look, I was gonna, I was gonna do this whether I was poor or not, so I'm gonna have to find a job that can pay well, and I'm not a drug dealer. So the only other thing was commercial fishing. In commercial fishing, you can make really, really good money if, you, if you're willing to put your life on the line, literally. That was one of the first times I fell in love with the water. Being on the ocean, being a kid, the whole, you know, your whole future's in front of you, and I'm working on a, on a commercial fishing vessel with a, with a, a really good college degree making it happen, paying the bills. We had really accomplished professors at Bowdoin. Um, so you would go to them and say, hey, you know what, I'm interested in this. Can I do a marine uh, independent study? And right away I knew I wanted to be in the marine industry because I was a commercial fisherman. I, I developed what is called a marine pinger. And it's a sonar device, it, it's this big. It goes on a fishing net and submerges and it sends out a ping. And it's, it hurts the ears of a marine mammal. So they stand away from, they stand back from the, the gill nets and they don't get killed. And it was awesome, it was rewarding. Marine pingers are now standard on all f gill fishing nets. All right, you guys, welcome to How and How Technologies. Holly is my EA. What's an EA? An EA is somebody that is the only person that can handle you with your brother besides your mother. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? You been out there? No, I just got in. Um, did you guys see a cold plunge this morning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Work out first thing in the morning. There we go. And, and then do your cold, cold plunge. So I'm like really cold. 47 degree water for 10 minutes. Ooh. I'm trying to feel it. <laughs> a little reset. My brother and I got together when we were, you know, in two, the 2000, uh, 1999-ish 
time frame. And we were looking for the next project. Originally, we were developing really unique mud run vehicles, um, extreme vehicles that were all tired and wheeled vehicles. We decided that we wanted to change the industry. We wanted to do something never been done before, which is make a, a high speed track vehicle. Nobody had ever done it. They're all just slow, you know, slow tanks. And so we just decided to do it. I'm ice cold, freeze. Give me a little more, please. Fly like the birds and the bees. Pose for the pig, cheese. And we knew the challenges. There's a ton of challenges in that. How do you make a track that has a certain, you know, how do you make a track stay on if you're gonna give it 18 inches of suspension? The suspension collapses, track gets loose, track comes off. We were self-funded from the start. We never did VC. Um, we never took a dime from anybody except for one sponsorship back in the beginning with DARPA. DARPA invited us okay. to the DC Auto Show. They had this kind of technology in the army type display. And we knew we had a vehicle that was amazing for the terrain capability. And when we went there, we impressed the army enough that we actually had got our first step into our military contracting. Twin brothers Mike and Jeffrey Howe are just a couple of homegrown engineers building the military's latest high-tech top secret hardware. Next Tuesday, the world's fastest track vehicle gets a refit for the U.S. Army. Our contracts with the U.S. Army are the most important part of our business. But when things start to fail... Uh, Discovery Channel at first we did welcome and, we, and it, was a, it was a great experience. But it does get a bit much when you have three cameras, two sound guys, two producers, and they're all telling you what to do and how to... And it just... They want drama. They don't necessarily care about innovation. They care about drama. They want fights. Um, and we're not about that, you know? So it did get, after a couple of years, it became a little bit more challenging. And Jeff and I had to find a way out. Um, and we stopped doing it. It's always hard with relationships, but I could not have done it without, with anybody else. It's so natural for us to run a business together. It, it, it just functions, it works. Mike and I have always had a great ability to attract people, talent, find the best in them, and then and then build teams to execute to the best of, you know, the best you can. This is the A team. And a lot of people might think, oh, I'm most proud of my inventions or my patents, but I'm actually most proud of this team. So I think the common theme for us is really about, about robotics and it's about developing technology that can help mankind. So over here, you'll see this, this is a thermite. This is a, this is a firefighting robot. This literally goes into buildings and puts out fires. So fire, you know, firemen don't have to, and they can create distance and it creates safety. The Badger is, we have, we're in the Guinness World Book of Records for developing the world's smallest tank for the Las Vegas SWAT team. And it's, it's like an egg. It was like a little egg you got in all armored and uh, it was our first commission build and it was really neat. The SWAT bot and the military equipment that has been coming out in the last few years has definitely been life-changing for law enforcement. We aren't super requirement based here. We're more, let's innovate and then see how it fits into society. And all these robots have done that, like the firefighting robot, the military robot for Ripsaw, and even the Rip Chair, which is our nonprofit. And we develop a, a tank chair for people that are paralyzed. For us, I needed something that had value beyond business and it had to have value back to society. It's more meaningful and more powerful than any paycheck. It was easy. It was easy. It was the easiest thing we ever did. A complex hybrid of a tank and a snowcat, the Ripsaw is unlike anything we've seen in the franchise before. 750 horsepower with the M153 Crow's remotely operated weapon station on top. This is heaven. Getting calls to get this in movies, it still doesn't get old. We still get them. It's just the best feeling in the world to be like, are you kidding me? Fast and Furious just called us and wants us in their movie. There's nothing better, you know? I think my favorite was working with The Rock, you know, on the set down in uh, um, Louisiana for your G.I. Joe. That was fun. That was two weeks, you know, training him to, to drive a ripsaw. And then I ended up being a stunt driver. So he, he didn't drive it well enough. Sorry, Dwayne. You did, you did do, you did just fine, but they did shave my head. And they, they made me tan. Her. So we had grown the business to a point where we were 
we were big enough in the robotics military industry that we were palatable to be bought. But Jeff and I never felt like we got the right deal. And we also never felt like we, the right business came along until Textron. Lisa Atherton, who now runs Bell Helicopter for Textron, um, saw us on Jay Leno. Like you never know where things are gonna go. Textron gave us the resources, the, the tooling, and um, the support to take our game to another level. And um, five and a half, six years later, we are now considered the front players in the military ground robotics. And Textron was an incredible player in that. One of the first things I built was a plywood boat. It was literally plywood, you know, screwed to plywood in a boat shape with two outriggers so we, it would be balanced. We put it in our pond and we had a kind of a makeshift or we might have been six or seven years old. The number one thing that I love about boating that stems back to my childhood is freedom. It, it was the freedom it gave me to be able to get on the water and go wherever I want. There's no path, there's no roads. For me, innovation starts with that sense of freedom, that sense to let the mind go. My first performance boat was a 16 foot jet boat with a blown 427 and it shot a 300 foot rooster tail. But then we matured into the more refined center consoles and then obviously the, the high speed cats. And actually How to Live started by mistake a little bit with a video that we had put together a, a, as a fun run. Um, and then the Bahamas trip from Miami to the Bahamas in a speedboat went super viral. And Sarah and I were, were left looking at it going, do we just drop it? We started How to Live because he was getting a little bored and he just wanted a new challenge. And so next thing you know, two years later, you have How to Live and it has absolutely taken off. It blows my mind that we have millions of views, 18 million views on YouTube and a million followers plus on Facebook. I love the people that we meet and the friends that we've made. We've definitely made some lifelong friendships in the last few years. I love it. It's, it is my like creativity release now that I need. There is a lot of work that goes into what they do. When you see, when you watch a you know 17 minute great, you're like, oh my gosh, that was great. That was Mike like taking three weeks to edit, post editing, you know, getting it all cut. And just like that, there she is. The new Mercury Racing V8. The score is gonna be really good. He spends a lot of money on finding the right music. Sarah's running all over the boat with the camera, tripping and falling, hurting herself. And Sarah's, Sarah's a police officer. She's working right now. She's down at the courthouse, probably, you know, jacking somebody up for spitting on the judge. I don't know, you know. You make a great product, I will talk about it if I like it. And MTI's done a fantastic job at that. They don't give me anything. I've bought everything. Um, and I want the viewers to know that too, because I don't necessarily want them to think that, that it's a bot feeling. It's not. I just like the product. I love that boat. I loved the 390 and I was sad when I knew that we were selling it and I absolutely love the 440. It's an amazing, amazing vessel. To me, I fall in love with that boat every time I get in it. I love being on the edge of technology. I love it. I, I don't want to be anywhere else. And what MTI has done and what and where we are right now with outboard cats is on the edge of evolution with high speed boating. It is the future. I didn't think I was going to own a boat like the like the like the 44 MTI in my life ever. I love it, but it doesn't mean I didn't need more. And then the, the the Mercury 600 came out and was able to be that last piece of the puzzle that allowed me to to develop the Kraken. You know, I'd I'd farm the idea around to a bunch of manufacturers domestically, and and they were just so busy they they didn't see the vision that I saw. And so once again, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it myself. So right now there's 29 days and 12 hours and 13 minutes until we get that boat to port. And it's like Christmas morning every, I don't sleep anymore. It's horrible. I can't wait. Yeah, I do it big, big, big. Don't tell me to win. I do it big, big, big. Say it again. I do it big. Bigger than most do it. If I see a wall, I'm a goat do it. Me and father.
I'm so rooted I don't wanna have to go stupid I don't wanna have to show you the rope Trust me, if you know, then you know 100 degrees or 40 below I'm doing it big for show Nah My mom couldn't afford hot lunch. She was a teacher, uh, a single mom teacher. So in order for us to have lunch, we had to become, we had to work in the cafeteria. We'd go down there and we'd set up all the milks and we'd hand out milks to all of our students. And after all that was done, we were able to get in line and, and, have, our, and have our lunch. Probably wouldn't happen these days. But I wouldn't be the person I am today if I didn't have that. We need struggle. Mike is, ex Mike is extremely driven. He's got a chip on his shoulder, you know, and he didn't put it there himself. Mike is extremely optimistic. He's very intelligent and he's very logical. When he wants to go after something, nothing's gonna stop him. And that's the truth. But he will put the work in to get there, you know? What makes Mike in the lead? He's definitely an excellent leader. Uh, Mike's done a lot in his life and so he's always looking for something that he hasn't done. And I'm fortunate enough to get to experience a lot of that with him. Oh, it's not all about requirements. It's about what's the art of what's possible. The art of what's possible leads innovation, not the art of what I need. It's mind blowing where life can lead you if you, you know, if, if you just let it. I just wanna feel like this. Sometimes I forget to write myself into the story So every time 